Okay, it's my great pleasure to be chatting with Nathan Schneider, uh, activist and author. Most recently, uh, everything for everyone. I'm uh, really looking forward to getting into the book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but um, really enjoyed your previous work with uh, Ours to Hack and Own, the platform co-op book with Trevor Schultz. Um, yeah, thanks very much for joining us. Very glad to be on. Thank you. Um, really interested, uh, kind of been tracking your work for a while. Um, I guess interested in this arc from Occupy to now. Um, just wonder if you give us a, a really brief um, chat about uh, how you found yourself at Occupy and uh, kind of that, um, that, yeah, that arc that's, that's heading towards uh, the publication of this book. Uh, well, I, I feel like I've spent the last 10 years since the start of the financial crisis kind of split uh, into two uh, into two sections. So for the first five years after 2008, I was really focused on stories of resistance. So I, um, uh, in 2009, co-founded a, a news website called Waging on Violence that was covering resistance movements around the world, um, helping movements kind of see each other and learn from each other. And, um, and so I was, uh, of course, really swept into the uh, movements that were spreading around the world in 2011 uh, and a little bit at the end of 2010. And, and uh, so I kind of came into Occupy through that. I was um, uh, fascinated with what was included in the stories that were coming up in the news and what wasn't. And, and one thing that our group um, found what wasn't being included was the planning and preparation process for um, things that would later enter into the streets and, you know, be seen on the news. And, and so I was uh, just looking, I was living in New York at the time and looking for uh, examples of planning processes that I could report on, you know, re really in depth just to show how much was missing. And um, so I started just seeing that there were a whole bunch of groups planning to do stuff at that time. And, and I uh, was going to, a, to meetings of several of them and one of those groups was what became Occupy Wall Street. So as, as a result of looking for that kind of story, I was drawn in, you know, before things got going and, and was kind of the first reporter to, you know, to be allowed to cover the planning meetings. Um, and, and then I, I uh, stuck around, you know, after most other reporters left and, and um, saw these activists as, you know, they, the media spotlight was gone and the, the protests were over and people had to figure out what to do with their lives and um, you know in a, in a world that they had not yet transformed and uh, and so you know a bunch of those people got involved in cooperative businesses um, either joining them starting them or helping others start them um, because they uh, saw this as you know the only way to live in this economy uh, with the values of of, uh, uh, that they'd formed and occupied intact, you know, a, a democratic kind of business. And, um, and that just drew me into this much broader movement um, and uh, made me realize that this was much bigger than I had, had realized uh, uh, before. And, and, you know, it kind of came to a head when I ended up moving out here to Colorado and uh, uh, it's where my family is from and, and learned that my grandfather had been a director of a cooperative and, you know, this guy is about as different from an Occupy activist as you could imagine. He's a conservative <laughs> farmer, uh, at least how we grew up. And, and um, uh, yet they were drawn to this cooperative model uh, by a lot of this, for a lot of the same reasons. And, yeah. um, you know, so, so it just uh, uh, continued surprising me and, and, uh, and continued urging me on to follow this new generation entering the, the movement. I'm interested in, um, I guess, this this oppositional versus creative kind of uh, tension that I guess, um, you know, obviously Occupy was an oppositional moment, but there was so much creativity in, in that moment. Um, I'm thinking of a, a really great interview, or like talk, um, uh, Yokai Benkler, the, um, the Wealth of Nations uh, uh, author, academic, uh, talking to Michelle Bounds from the Peer to Peer Foundation. And uh, Yokai Benkler asked uh, uh, Bounds about um, about this tension between conflict and uh, and uh, creativity, basically. Um, I just 
wonder if you've got any, any thoughts on that yourself. And I guess, you know, particularly um, looking at moments of uh, crisis or, you know, yeah, just uh, speak to that a little bit if you can. Well, you know, I think a lot of people have come to think that um, movements come out of moments of crisis and, and, you know, like when people hit rock bottom, that was the narrative being peddled a lot in 2011. You know, people were looking at food prices in Egypt and trying to identify this as the cause of, of what was happening. And, um, you know, I, I could go into the details, uh, um, you know, but the, the, in my view, I've come to conclude that really crisis doesn't tend to explain a lot. Um, opportunity and inspiration tends to explain the spread of movements much more. Um, you know, if you look at all the different places that the movement of 2011 spread, you know, they have so little in common except that they shared this same kind of meme, this same kind of idea about what resistance can look like. And suddenly they felt empowered to take on whatever their challenges were. Um, it was really a, uh, a spread of inspiration, not a spread of crisis. You know, if, if, if crisis were what caused movements, there would have been an uprising in, you know, 20, 2009, 2010. Um, and it, it was the inspiration of, of the success in Tunisia and, and Egypt that I think was really motivating. Uh, second is, you know, what are the background factors that enable people to uh, take risk to to uh, engage in resistance and and you know Gandhi would always say for instance that you know that that his movement was 90% what he called the constructive program which was stuff like setting up ashrams and and spinning on spinning wheels and you know making your own cloth and all, all these kind of practices of life and self-reliance and that the resistance everybody saw you know in the newspapers was just the the tip of the iceberg to use an overused metaphor and and um and the you know i think we see that repeated over and over in social movements certainly here in the u.s um there's a kind of uh, a story that has been totally neglected often about about um what was about the economic practices underlying social movements. Um, you know, people who were uh, registering to vote, black uh, uh, farmers registering to vote in the, in the South in the 1950s and 60s, you know, often they had to be co-op farm members in order, to, um, in order to take that risk because if they were sharecroppers, they'd be kicked out of their uh, farm like Fannie Lou Hamer was, you know, these are, um, and when you talk to people who are part of these movements, they, you know, they'll tell you that they were, they weren't just registering to vote, they were setting up credit unions. Um, this was part of the process, but it's not a part of the process that tends to be, uh, uh, that tends to figure into the, the story that gets told in the news or in history. Yeah. Well, that sounds like an interesting topic, topic for a next book to really spell that out, Nathan, because that's, um, I won't say that's news to me, but I'd, I'd love to um, be more in touch with that kind of history. So there you go. There's a, a job coming out of this interview if you've not uh, had that in mind already. But um, yeah, talk to us about this this new book. I mean, um, and you're really interested, I guess, to to hear a bit about uh, the link ups um, of all this uh, internationally because it's um, so much of uh, you know if uh, any of this means anything, um, it needs to be in this national movement, a transnational movement, doesn't it? Yeah, and it, it really, it, for me, it was a transnational process. Um, you know, here in the US, for instance, there are pretty kind of siloed categories of like activist and entrepreneur. And for me, it was really important to come to, um, uh, to Europe first, and then, you know, later also Australia and New Zealand, and also uh, South America, um, uh, later in, uh, uh, in Kenya and Africa, uh, to, to see different kind of subcultures. Uh, than what I was seeing in, in the U.S., you know, and among the people I'd been working with in New York and around Occupy, you know, uh, uh, engaging in entrepreneurship was not uh, a common thing, and, and people were very focused on the critical work, and uh, I, I learned a lot from, from activists in other places where the cultures were different and the strategies were different. Um, also, in, in the U.S., the tech culture is so so totally kind of in the um, captured by the venture capital model, you know, where where investors and in, get in early on uh, 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 nascent tech companies and 
uh, really own and control the whole process from there. Uh, and there's so much of that in the U.S. that that um, it's hard to escape um, if you are part of a particular kind of elite coastal um, uh, uh, tech community. Uh, but in in places where there are more diverse funding streams, like you know there's some state funding or uh, uh, you know there are other mechanisms by which people are are uh, financing their ventures. You know you see people with a little more creativity, and it was really. Um, uh, particularly in Europe, that I started to recognize that there was a um, an alternative sharing economy starting to form uh, in 2014, just as kind of the, the consensus of the um, you know people started realizing that this these Airbnbs and Ubers were not a real sharing economy. Um, you know, I, I started seeing hey, that there's there's a bunch of projects out there that are trying to do a real sharing economy. And that meant that they were using this old tradition of cooperative enterprise to own and govern uh, their businesses together. Uh, and, and then I even you know, started seeing such projects happening closer to home once I kind of got attuned to that in other places. Um, and, and so it's, and since then the development of what's come to be known as platform cooperativism um, you know, has been always a very international effort just because, um, you know, we need each other. We need to learn from each other. And, uh, and, and if it were just bound to, uh, to one place, we uh, would just have too little to work with. So it's, it's been uh, powerfully international. And, and, you know, I'm now very uh, excited that the next Platform Co-op Conference, you know, after being in New York for three years is in Hong Kong. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're really... Uh, uh, expanding our, our partnerships and our, um, you know, our, our kind of location so that it's not centered in any one place. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, as well, Nathan, your, I guess, your spiritual kind of uh, heritage and, and you, you know, your thoughts, uh, you know, what motivates you on that level. And I guess, uh, apart from, you know, your own personal journey there. Uh, I'm interested in, you know, one of the, the really powerful memes that I don't know whether it came about directly in Occupy, but um, certainly um, I came across in, during the Occupy moment was this um, image of a, a policeman uh, stomping on flowers and, um, you know, you can stomp the flowers, but you can't stop the spring. Uh, you know, that, that's a really you know, quite a powerful motif for me. Um, I'm just wondering, yeah, if you'd like to talk to that a little bit. And obviously, you have a particular uh, tradition. I understand a Christian kind of uh, background there, but is uh, just going a bit deeper than that uh, in a way. You know, what's the uh, just the underlying logic or you know change in that, that kind of relational dynamic that's um, that, for want of a better word, we can call spiritual, which is so much part of this. Um, this, you know, I consider anyway, and I wonder what your thoughts are. Yeah, it, it, I think the spiritual dimension is, I, I find hard to talk about in some ways with respect to the cooperative movement because it's so integral, yet at the same time, uh, the movement has, has always been so insistent on its kind of openness. Uh, uh, you know, the first cooperative principle is, you know, open and voluntary membership. And one of the you know, one of the things that that open word means is non-denominational, you know, and you're, you think of 19th century England, you know, the, you know, what open would have meant is, you know, it's okay, Catholics and Protestants can both join Quakers too, you know, yeah. uh, uh, that, that's the kind of context that, that that's coming from. And, and so, you know, this is a movement that has uh, historically been um, very anxious to say, you have to believe this set of things in order to practice it. And that's one of the beautiful things about it, that you don't need to um, believe it all before you start doing it. And then, uh, you know, you don't have to be indoctrinated with a certain kind of comprehensive worldview in order to participate in or form a, a cooperative. Um, and we don't want to limit it in that way. Yet, um, uh, that in the history of this movement, um, spiritual and religious uh, uh, movements have been really powerfully influential. And, and I'm uh, personally a Roman Catholic, and so I've spent most of the time in working on this project focused on the role of that tradition, uh, which, which has been far more considerable than I expected at first. You know, uh, 
I just started noticing, for instance, you know, the largest you know, worker cooperative network in the world, Mondragon in the Basque region in Spain was founded by a priest, uh, Catholic priest, half blind, uh, uh, kind of priest journalist named Jose Maria Arismendiarieta. And, and, you know, then Canada and the, the North American uh, credit union movement was really begun, you know, out of Catholic communities as well. Uh, uh, one of the major leaders in the development of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives among uh, black farmers in the U.S. South was a, uh, a black Catholic priest um, uh, uh, and Father uh, Albert McKnight, and um, and so on. Um, and and you know there are ways in which one can point to how these religious traditions have um, institutionally and intellectually fed into this movement. Um, it's uh, it's a really powerful story and a recognition of the way in which people have seen this movement kind of align with their their moral priorities but in a in a more abstract sense i think the um one of the fundamental assumptions i think that motivates cooperative enterprise is that is that business forms us as moral beings and as spiritual beings you know the ways we transact the ways we create value the ways we we relate to each other in our you know in our economic lives shape who we are in other respects as well and um, and when you take that notion seriously, um, uh, suddenly this kind of business becomes really important. Uh, it becomes a, a, a kind of business that, uh, you know, in a sense is the only kind of business that, that makes sense for, for producing, you know, moral adults, uh, people who, are, who are, have some intrinsic dignity, who have some um, power of decision making and, and intelligence, uh, you know, accorded to them by whatever power, um, uh, you know, this is the kind of business that's designed to encourage that rather than discourage that. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not surprising that so many religious traditions have kind of gravitated toward these kinds of models uh, as an expression of, of, you know, what they claim to hold uh, about who the human person is.